Just over 50 years ago, on May 30, 1967, Biafra, a region in southeastern Nigeria, declared its independence. A few weeks later, the government of Nigeria began a bloodthirsty war against the secessionist area. In the course of this two and a half year conflict, in which the Nigerian army committed unspeakable atrocities, some 1.5 million people died, mainly members of the Igbo ethnic group. Some 80% died due to famine. Nigeria was formed as a colony by Britain and received its independence in 1960. Today it is a presidential republic. It calls itself a federal state, but in fact, it is strongly centralized. It has a population of some 190 million, made up of about 500 different ethnic groups. And now the issues highlighted is that Bafrans are going to ask Southeast politicians hard questions on Namdi Kanu's were about come 2019 general election Senator Enemaya Abarib. More details will be released later. Source, Radio Biafra. Welcome back to Nigeria, the road to 2019. I'm Charles Anya Golden. Now let's talk about the unspoken thought, a looming presence that not that's not on top of the news agenda anymore, is not apparently being urgently addressed, but is impossible to ignore. And that is the question of the whereabouts of Namdi Kanu, leader of the proscribed and some say secessionist group, the indigenous people of Biafra. Or IPOB. With me in the studio is the Nigerian MP who stood bail for Namdi Kanu and who's been accused severally of having close links with IPOB, Senator Enyine Abaribe. Thank you very much indeed for staying with us. You. Now, you were one of three bail sureties that stood for Namdi Kanu, the controversial leader of that prescribed group IPOB who has not been seen or heard of since I think September 2017 when the army invaded his home and you have no clue where he is no I don't and do you know anyone who might know where he is or what's happened to him <clears throat> our contention is that since the army were the last people to see him on the basis of what in law is called uh, the doctrine of last scene, mm. that they should be the people to give an idea about where he is. Because, uh, like you said, the army stormed his place, and since that time, they, he's been uh, disappeared. Nobody yeah, but knows. What, I, what I find quite extraordinary um, is the fact that, I mean, I've never been to Namdi Kanu's house, but I've seen lots of pictures of his house and him, and, and there are always lots and lots of people. I mean, he was treated almost like some sort of a, you know, an, a, an elected official or something with lots of people always around him. Yes. Um, what I don't understand is how is it possible for the army to invade his house and he's the only one who's sort of there and then you know, he he's disappears and nobody sees him being spirited away or anything like that. I mean, how well, do you I, I think I think I think that's a that's a question we're going to have to ask the army. Well, that's a question because, I'm also because, asking because, people because, who are because, connected because, because to I can, IPOB I because they could easily have spirited him away themselves. Understand what the Minister of Defense said. Right. The Minister of Defense said that they saw him. They saw a vehicle carrying ammunition into his house, and they pursued that vehicle, and the vehicle, and there was an explosion, and since then, they don't know what happened. That was from the Minister of Defense. And so you could see that the stories don't, um, it doesn't gel at mm. all. So I have no idea, and uh, I, I was asked by the court to produce him, and we're in court at the moment, and we are vigorously challenging the narrative of the military. Yeah, because I understand that you filed a motion seeking to be discharged as, as a surety for Mr. Kanu, but that request was refused by a judge, is that correct? No, we didn't file a motion seeking to be discharged. We filed a motion to say to them there are circumstances that led to his disappearance. Right. And there are people that are supposed to be on the side of government that led to his disappearance. And so that this is a novel area in law 
if government is charging him and the same government has also done things that have led to his disappearance so who should take the blame right so what did the court say well, the matter is still ongoing. But I understand that they, the, I mean, is it correct to say that uh, you, you opted to be given more time to produce Mr. Cannon? No, they, they were still in court. So, you know, the court will give us time to file our different papers. Don't forget that we are three. Right. And so each of the shorties right. had to come up with their own defense. But, but have you, in your own um, capacity as someone who has some affiliation with him, given that you stood as a surety for him. Have you made any progress at all in trying to figure out where he is as a, your own independent investigation, talking to the people who were around on that day who possibly saw the events unfolding? No, I haven't bothered. The reason why I haven't bothered also is very simple too. If government itself does acts that lead to his disappearance coming around to ask me as private citizen to also undertake what government can do which is investigation mm. then that is asking too much from me and so we, we, we want to see how it's going to go in court was there any sense at all on your part that supporting Namdi Kanu as you did might put you in the radar of the Nigerian government and that by him calling for the breakaway of a part of Nigeria that could be seen as treasonous and might create a problem for you as a senator sworn to preserve and protect the unity of Nigeria. I do not see what he was looking for as treasonous understand what they asked for they said we want to have a referendum to determine the basis of our being part of this country which they claim is a fundamental right of any human being you're not going to be in a union by force and so they never carried any arms. They never killed anybody. They never did anything except to carry their flags and demand a referendum. And so all I saw they were doing was a cry to the Nigerian uh, 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 federal government that the basis for our union for all people in Nigeria, not just the people, uh, the indigenous people, every part of Nigeria that everybody was hurting in some way. And that is what has led, if you know today, to what the raging cry for restructuring everywhere. The reason why are people asking for restructuring, they know that this, the way we are going, is going to lead us nowhere. There has to be a fundamental um, rearrangement mm -hmm. in this country. And so I saw it merely as people expressing their rights within the country. Where we differ from the federal government is that people are going around this country clearly doing treasonous things, killing people, destroying villages, going all over the place, committing mayhem, and they're being treated with kid gloves. They're not even being uh, designated so the United Nations now designates those people, the Hartsmen, as a terrorist group, does not designate IPOB as a terrorist group. And so the government prefers to wield a very, very big stick. And that makes every person from the Southeast feel that they are being treated as second-class mm. citizens. Just very briefly, because we're almost out of time, looking ahead to the 2019 elections, do you think the matter of the whereabouts of Anamdi Kanu, the matter of the prescription of IPOB should be one of the key issues in the upcoming election? It will be an issue in the Southeast. There's absolutely no uh, reason why it will not be an issue. Because people are going to ask questions. People are going to ask us as political leaders, what have you done? 
So it must be an issue. Senator Enyinaya Abaribe, thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. Well, that's it for this edition of Nigeria, The Road to 2019. Join us again for a fresh edition tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.